Yeah, I was doing pretty good till he did all that. Huh? <laughs> Last service, I was a emotional wreck. I think it, maybe I'm allergic to the Holy Spirit. That's what I tell people. So thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for being here. It's It is my last Sunday, but I want to leave you with something that, you know, years ago, God used a mess in my own life to kind of teach me through a lot of pain, through a lot of regret, uh, what what we're going to talk about today. So it's some of it's teaching, some of it's very personal. It's all very personal, but what God has taught me, I want to share with you and encourage you to take your mess, maybe hopefully prevent a mess. That's the best option. Uh, because of sin, we're all in a mess, but it, it can only get worse if we uh, ignore it. And God can use any mess for his good, but I would encourage you not to get in too big, too big a messes like I did. But if you're in a mess of any kind, I, I just want you to hear today that God is bigger than that and his love will see you through it. And so to bless this mess, that's what we're going to continue for week three. And so the last couple of weeks, Tyler has done a great job of kind of setting the stage that God won't waste a mess. And I'm so thankful for that because when you find yourself in a difficult situation, you want to know that God's not going to waste it. And so that's encouragement. And then he's with you in the mess. And so thankfully that you're not alone in your mess. You're not alone in your journey. You're not alone in your struggle. And God can use it for good. And so what I want to share today is what God did in my life to give me a message, which is our big idea today, is Jesus will transform your mess into a message. And not just any message. It's, it's, we could glorify the mess. We could paint this awful story of the guy that wrecked his life and, or the lady that wrecked her life. And that's not what it's about. This is about turning your mess into God's message where he has done a mighty work, where he has, despite your mess, he turned it into something that he used for good to bring others to himself and also take you to a deeper place of faith. And so I have a, it's really an understatement to call what I did a few years ago a mess. It's, that's, that's, tame. Uh, Just to be honest, it's more scandalous than that. And so I don't know what your mess looks like, what, how minor or how awful it is, but mine was very scandalous. It was awful. Uh, I wish I could go back. I wish I could undo what I did. I wish uh, God had put me on a diff. I wish, no, God didn't put me on that path. God restored the path I had put myself on. I wish I had a different story. I don't wish I had a different outcome. And so I don't want to glorify the mess because it's awful. And what my wife has to live with and the the things I've had to share with her are terrible. And I'm not here to to glorify that. I'm here to tell you that even in the midst of my lowest, most awful sin as a Christian, as a dad, as a husband, God still met me right there. And so I hope that wherever you're facing, that God will turn it into something that you can say, wow, look what God did. When I thought all was hopeless, look what God did. Now look what I did. I promise you, I did some awful things. But despite that, God saw fit in his grace and his love and his forgiveness to give us a message of hope that I want to share with you today. And, and there's a big word. Now, I'm from Mississippi. We don't have a lot of six-syllable words we use, but this is one of those words. It's called reconciliation. I don't use this word a lot, but it's a word I want you to know because it's a word that is how Jesus will transform your mess into a message using a word like this. It's, it's reconciliation. And it's a word that I could not have preached on years ago. If God had not intervened on my behalf, on our behalf, I would not be able to stand up here today. But there's two, one, reconciliation to God. What a, what a message that we want to be reconciled to God. And only because of Jesus is that even possible. For thousands of years, we relied on the priest and the sacrifice of animals and the law to try to save us and to restore what was broken. But because of Jesus, now we are reconciled to God. And so... Uh, and then well, part of that is also to each other. The, this world <coughs> needs to see 
at least the church people, the Christians, getting along a little better. And so we need to be on this mission of reconciling with other people. And this is something I had to learn the hard way. And so it's not, there's a lot of things on, thoughts on reconciliation. And so I just attended a 21 hour workshop on reconciliation. So in 20 minutes, we're not going to cover it all, but I want to at least share with you, does not mean that a relationship will necessarily be restored. It, it means it opens the door for a possibility of trust to be rebuilt, but it doesn't guarantee it. But without it, you'll never get that. And so what we're going to talk about today is how reconciliation to God ultimately, then as we're called to reconcile with others, what that looks like, what that means, and using a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you have the Bible app, you have a Bible, if you just want to look on the screen, I would encourage you to go ahead and find that because God is calling us to be reconciled to himself and then to each other. Sometimes we're pretty good at the whole reconcile to God because we come to church, we hear a message, we like, okay, God, I can confess to you, but don't make me tell anybody else what I'm struggling with. Uh, and then sometimes we can't reconcile with others because we're just too afraid to risk it. And maybe we just don't understand, but I think a lot of us understand more than we're willing to do. So the great news is because of Jesus, you can reconcile to God and to each other. And you may be scared to death of your mess. I certainly was. And so I want to share a little bit about from the scripture and also our journey of how God used my mess to turn into his message. And so if you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. All right. <laughs> you sure? All right. Well, let's jump off. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's just stop at the first word, therefore. Basically, it said Jesus undid the curse of thousands of years. It started in, the, in our Christian Bible, Genesis is the first book, and in the second chapter, things start to turn, and in chapter three of the whole entire Bible, sin enters a picture and wrecks everything. Like, what just happened? Everything was awesome, and Adam and Eve had to go sin and blow it, and ever since, we've had trouble seeing God as he really is. And so for thousands of years, God would give his people. He set aside his people. He gave them the message of hope. He, they sinned. They suffered the consequences. He would then restore them. And that's been our story from, from years and years and thousands of years. But Jesus came and undid the curse of sin in his life and his death, his resurrection. And so what it's saying is Jesus, therefore he did what was impossible for us to do. And so if we're going to follow Jesus, we're committing to a new way that was not possible before him. Yes, we had animal sacrifices. Thankfully, you didn't have to bring your perfect little animal sacrifice to church to make an offering. We like our little animals, right? We don't want to have to give them away to sacrifice. Thankfully, Jesus undid the need for all of that. So if you read the Old Testament, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's like, what are you talking about? Animal sacrifices. Well, thank goodness you don't have to worry about it. Because of Jesus, in Adam, everybody was cursed by sin. But because of Jesus, everybody, the sin curse was broken. And so therefore, if you're in Christ, let's keep reading. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And all of this is from God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so all this from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, his followers, the ministry of reconciliation. And so because we've been reconciled to God through Jesus, he's then saying, okay, now do this for other people. And so Paul, the writer here, is talking to Corinthian believers and followers of Jesus. They're struggling in their faith, but he's saying, hey, it's a new way. You don't live for yourself anymore. You've, you died with Christ. You rose with Christ. Now live for him. And so his ways are a little different than our ways. My preference is not to reconcile with people I don't like. But that's not what he said. He said he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And so look at this. But that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, which is a big deal, by the way. 
I don't know if we always realize how big a deal it is that Jesus came, lived, and suffered, and died, this, and, and was punished for the sin we committed. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Not because we wanted him to, he, he initiated reconciliation. And so, and he has committed, what, and he has not counted people's sins against them. Man, I got people, I need to let go of some stuff, right? But God is saying, hey, I'm not, I'm willing to, because of my son Jesus, not count your sin against you. And so therefore, he has committed us to do the same thing for other people. What would this world be like if we did more of this? If we would stop judging people so harshly, if we would stop holding their sins against them and first of all, be reconciled to God and then do it with other people. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, his messengers, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so the first thing today is, have you been reconciled to God? Jesus did everything possible. And he's saying, have you received this gift? And two, are you doing this for other people? Now, this is going to expose for a lot of us a lot of fear, a lot of doubts, a lot of concerns, but I'll just kind of share with you how it happened for us is I didn't initiate reconciliation. I didn't ask. Well, I was in the middle of a major sin path and thankfully, God saw fit to call me out of that. But since then, I've learned the process of reconciliation is not just lip service. And so the word itself means to, to repair, to make good again. And then, then it opens the door for trust building and restoration possibly, but it doesn't guarantee it. And so in this 21-hour workshop I just attended, it just confirms this. And so there are three ingredients to reconciliation. And so for you to know, have you been reconciled to God? And are you able and willing to reconcile with others so that you can bless this mess, so to speak? I would encourage you to write these down or at least think through them. And let's talk to this. Let's do a little teaching time together because reconciliation has three ingredients. For years, I tried to reconcile without these three ingredients. I had one somewhat down because I knew I was wrong. I would, like I said, I was a Christian. I was a husband, a father. I was a pastor. And I was found out to be a liar, a fraud, a cheat, and betrayal. I knew I was wrong. But I wasn't willing to do the second ingredient that we'll talk about. And therefore, I was stuck for years. And so let's look quickly at the three ingredients. The first one is repentance. Again, these are some words maybe you don't use every day. Have you repented today, honey? Well, you don't talk like that probably, right? Uh, you might. If you do, that's awesome. But most of us don't go around using these words we're about to share. So repentance, confession, and forgiveness. These are three ingredients to reconciliation. Again, reconciliation does not guarantee you're going to hang out with a person on the weekends. It doesn't mean trust has been formed. It doesn't mean you guys are awesome again and everything's cool again. No, it opens the door for the possibility for that to occur. I was pretty good on this one. I say that, I really wasn't. I knew I was wrong, but I was not willing to do anything about it. And so don't worry, we're gonna define these. But one thing I was unwilling to do is confess. And certainly couldn't start the process of forgiveness without it. So let's look at each word individually. Repentance. An internal change of mind and heart. You are grieving your sin. This is not just a behavior change, okay? It's, it's the whole concept if you're going in this direction and then you realize you're going the wrong direction and you make a 180. Well, it's that, yes. That's the behavior part. But the heart change is, the word is metanoia. It's a transformation of knowing. 
You're not just, you not just recognize you're wrong, you're, you're heartbroken by it. You're, you're grieved over your sin, you're broken. It's hard to change your behavior if you don't have deep conviction that what you're doing is utterly wrong. It's not that you say, well, I probably shouldn't go get a greasy burger this afternoon because it's unhealthy. Yeah, that's repentance if you don't go do that, okay? But you're not grieved over it until you have some kind of illness that is taking your life 100,000 hamburgers into the journey, right? Okay, so my point is this. You, can, you have to have a grieving part of the change because you don't just change unless it's painful. Because a lot of us stay stuck in this, this rut. We're afraid to change. We, yeah, it's, a, it's inconvenient. It's unpleasurable. We know we should do different. But until you've had that grieving of loss and then you start to take action, turning from your sin to God. And so repentance is basically this. I see it. I get it. And I'm acting on it. I don't just know I'm wrong. I'm actually going to make the changes to do that. Unfortunately, I did not make any necessary changes until I was forced to. And so the years of damage had been occurring. My health was horrible. My spiritual condition was terrible. My wife knew something was wrong. I was repentant three weeks before I was exposed in 2011. I had a friend look me in the eye and say, look, man, I know something's wrong. Why don't you just tell me? And I lied to his face. I had committed privately to doing different. I was repentant, but I was lacking step two, which is confession. To agree, verbalize and express your repentance to the offended party. This is a big one. Without blame or excuses. I was confronted in April of the same year. I lied to this woman. She said, I was going to tell your boss, but he was out of the country on a mission trip. You have two months to tell your wife or I will tell her. I lied to her face. I was willing to change without confession. And unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. I was, list I was thinking about this morning. I know this is so dumb. It's like a song, Meatloaf. You ever heard of Meatloaf? I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> I will do anything for reconciliation, but don't ask me to confess. I will do anything except that. For you to tell me to verbalize and to say out loud what I've done, not only calls myself out, I put myself at risk of who knows what, prison, being killed, judged, being found out to be a fraud, lose my family, lose my job, lose my kids, lose respect. And we don't think about it before we get ourselves in a mess. And when someone says, well, you need to confess that which you already know is wrong, you're like, well, I'll do a lot of things, but I'm not going to do that. And so when I was confronted, we had to go meet with my pastor after I had to tell my wife, which was worse, he said, well, you need to tell the church publicly that I had been unfaithful to my wife. And there were 600 people sitting in the auditorium two days later. And I said, I'm not doing that. This was a Friday. He said Sunday. I said, well, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to do that like I had any room to negotiate. And I did do that. And that is what started the process of healing. I knew I was wrong. But to have to tell people about the deepest, darkest secret I had kept for years, for you to tell me that I need to tell the church because they need to hear it and I need to do it. And we will walk with you through this process, Scotty, of reconciliation if you do this. That is the one thing I, re I did not want to do. But if you want reconciliation, if you want healing, confession is necessary. There's a few verses here. Psalm 32. David says... When I kept silent, 
my bones wasted away. Sin and secrets will keep you stuck. They will eat you alive internally. I was physically, had looked like I'd aged 10 years. I was only 35. I probably looked, I was aging. Sin was just eating me up. The lies were eating me up. Spiritually, I was dead. I was miserable, defensive. And so, and David says in 30, Psalm 32, he said, but when I confessed, it's like springs of life or water, refreshing, it's something like that. But the point is to refuse to confess keeps you stuck. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to another so that you may be healed. If you want healing, then confession is a part of that. Without blame, without excuse. I mean, that's a huge part of this because if you go to someone and say, I said I was sorry. Well, that's not really without blame. And some people are like, well, you're going to hold this over my head for the next 20 years? Well, they might. <laughs> they probably should. But that's not your job to tell them that. You have, if you are truly <laughs> repentant, you can't make excuses why you sinned. You're a sinner. <laughs> You're going to screw up. But the worst thing you can do is when you're busted to blame someone else for your choices. It's not about excuses at this point. It's about I was wrong. I am sorry. I have no excuse for what I did. And so true confession is agreement as a result of repentance. And so it took me, it didn't take me long, but I was so desperate to walk out of the sin and darkness that I was willing to stand up in front of 600 people and tell them. And what happened after that was truly unexpected. I've shared this before at the church, but I expected condemnation this was a small Baptist church in a small town of Mississippi. I knew a lot of people, and I expected the worst. I didn't expect 100 people to circle around us and pray for us. I didn't see that. I did not see that one coming, and it broke every bit of shame And so the gift of confession is what brings healing. It's so contradictory, though, because there's a statement that says this, you are only as free as the secrets you keep. I know in AA it says you're only sick as your secrets. I heard a pastor share this. He, he made this slight adjustment. I like both, but you are only as free as the secrets you keep. I was not free. I was trying to get free, but the secret kept me stuck. There's Romans in the book of the Bible, in a chapter book called Romans says, evil thrives in darkness and, and in secrecy. God works in the light. And so he's inviting you to bring it into the light because you will never be free. And I'm not suggesting that you get up here and do confessional with the church. It's not what I'm suggesting. I was going to bury my secret forever. Thankfully, that didn't happen because I would not be able to stand up here today. So I'm just asking you, have you repented? Have you truly had a heart change about the sin you've committed Last weekend, last night, last year, the decade I call 2020 a decade, 10 years of 2020, right? It's just, it's been a weird year, right? And so it continues. We're at the end of the year finally, I think. You know, we have a few more years left called November and December. It doesn't ever seem to want to end. And so why not end this decade called 2020 with some freedom? because you're only going to be as free as the secrets you keep. But don't hear me say that it's not going to cost you something. It's going to cost you. But what you gain is way more.
And so the third ingredient is this, forgiveness. Very heated conversation, topic of discussion called forgiveness. How can you forgive someone who's done such awful things? So right now we're talking about the offender. Asking for the undeserved gift by saying, will you forgive me? Not, I hope you will. Not, I'm sorry you feel that way. It's, I have repented. My heart is broken over the things I've done to you. I've confessed it. I agree. I don't make excuses. And I'm asking you to humbly forgive me. Will you forgive me? I don't deserve it, but to be set free, will you forgive me? That is the third ingredient of reconciliation. I think as Christians, as church people, as Americans, I think we're terrible at this. I don't think we like to repent. I don't, like, I don't think we like to be told we're wrong. I don't, like, I don't think we like to agree that we're wrong. I don't think we like to admit we're wrong. And then certainly to ask someone to forgive me. Because here's the deal. If you go before God and confess your sin, and you ask God, will you forgive me? What do you think he's going to say? Yes. It's always yes in Jesus. But I don't know about the person you're sitting with. I can't guarantee they're going to say yes. But if they follow Jesus, then they have been called to, to the ministry of reconciliation. And it may not happen the first time you ask. But I can't justify not forgiving someone because of what God has done for me. Now, I need to see repentance. I need to see confession. I need to see a little more time pass before I'm willing to say yes sometimes. However, this is a truth that you're going to have to wrestle with, is there will come a time when you need to forgive someone who is not repentant because as you maybe have heard this saying, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. Forgiving someone is for your benefit, for your sake, to free yourself from the pain of unforgiveness. They may or may not be repentant. They may not agree that what they did was hurtful to you, but you may have to make the hard decision to say, I forgive you anyway. Because you need to let that weight off of yourself. Now, as you may have guessed, you may not have reconciliation with, if they are not repentant. But you don't have to carry around and drink the poison of unforgiveness. And so when I looked at my wife and I told her all that I had done, thankfully, God had broken me so much. I was repentant, I had confessed. And she willingly forgave me, but it did not come without a price. It has been nine years since I sat in front of her and told her the worst thing I could tell her. And so I don't, it doesn't always work out. I don't, it's a miracle that we're together. She was here this first service. I was an emotional mess because it just, I'm just so amazed that she is, we're still together. It's truly, if you knew the awful things she has in her heart, in her mind that I have shared with her, you would quickly run to God and praise him for his amazing grace. That is, that is the only reason we have been able to stay together because of God and because of people in our life that have walked with us. We have been through two marriage intensives. One was 32 hours one was 50 hours. And I had a non-repentant client one time tell me, look, I gave you six hours this week. I said, look, you don't understand. You're just scratching the surface. <laughs> I said, if you're, we have just finished a 50 hour intensive. I don't know that I've cried that much in my whole life, but here's what we found out. Jesus will transform your mess into a message through the painful yet freeing process of reconciliation. On January 27th of 2020, it feels like many years ago now, 
we walked through our second marriage intensive just to finally deal with some family stuff. We went back three generations. And we had eight people sit around a table and two counselors. And it was the most grueling, painful, healing, freeing thing we've ever done. Because they told us when you went, we went to a marriage intensive a week after I confessed in 2011. So I confessed to my wife on August 26, 2011. We were in Branson, Missouri on September 2nd. And it probably saved our marriage. And so when we went to another one nine years later, he said, you really should have done one three years, at least three years after the first one because you're dealing with a crisis. And so thankfully we were able to go to another one. And we hit Tuesday of five days and hit this wall. And I wasn't sure for some reason we were gonna make it to Friday. It was a wall we had hit for years in our healing process. And thankfully, I don't like to cry by myself in a room privately with the lights off, so I'm, this is not staged, I promise you. This, if you're uncomfortable with a preacher crying, I'm sorry. And thankfully God showed up and our friends and the counselors walked us through that. And on Friday, he said, congratulations, you have been reconciled. I know it's very difficult. It's so difficult. But I promise you, if you put yourself in a position to let Jesus turn your mess into a message through this beautiful, painful, scary process called reconciliation, you will get the healing you've been longing for. And other people will see God's grace demonstrated in your life. Now, I'm not suggesting this is easy. I'm not saying it, there's any guarantees. But I know that God has called us to be reconciled to himself. And he's asked us to do that with other people. And you're going to need some help. You're going to need people to walk with you through this journey. But as you remember, God is not going to waste your mess. And God is with you in your mess. And because of Jesus, who stepped out of heaven and initiated reconciliation with us, he has given us everything we need to reconcile with others. And there's no guarantee they're going to want it, okay? But you got to at least pursue it. You can only do what only you can do, right? And so God will have to lead it I don't know how it's going to turn out for you. But why not try? Why not trust enough to say, God, help me repent. Help me confess. And help me seek forgiveness. So that others would see how good you are. There's a line in this movie, I know it was controversial, but this movie has done more for me and then a lot of movies, it's called The Shack. I've read the book twice. I've met the author. I watched 20 episodes of the author's rendition of why he wrote the book. And there's a line in the movie where Mac, the lead a actor, is talking to Jesus. And Mac is asking him all the questions. He said, do all roads lead to you, Jesus? And Jesus said, no. Some roads don't lead anywhere. 
but there is no road I will not go down to find you. There is no road. He will not come down to find you and bring you home. No matter how awful you think your mess is, he will come get you. And so I would ask you to bow your heads and just listen to these two questions. Is one, have you been reconciled to God? We just celebrated the Marines' birthday and Veterans Day because it's on a calendar. We should recognize veterans every day, right? Because of our freedom. But since it's on the calendar, it reminds us all to pause on that day and to celebrate what is true. And so I would ask you this, do you have on your personal calendar the day you were reconciled to God? Do you know the day that you truly repented, that you confessed, I can't save myself, Jesus. I can't earn my way into heaven. Will you forgive me? It's not something you have to hope. It's something you can have. And so I would ask, have you been reconciled to God? Jesus has done everything. He initiated, he fulfilled it, he died, he suffered, he rose again so that you might have eternal life now and forever. Have you repented? Have you confessed? And have you asked the question that he always says yes to? And then secondly, is there someone in your life Maybe they're not alive anymore, but maybe they are, where you need to seek reconciliation. Doesn't guarantee trust will be rebuilt. It doesn't guarantee you're going to hang out on the weekends. But have you done your part to try to re receive reconciliation through repentance, confession, and forgiveness? But then there's that person in the mirror, yourself. It took me years to forgive myself because I made it about my sin. I didn't make it about the grace of God. So are you ready to forgive yourself as well? Father God, thank you for reconciliation. Thank you that because of Jesus, we can all be reconciled to you. I pray that we all make that official today if we've never done that. And then I pray that we would have the courage to pursue reconciliation with other people to the best of our ability and with your grace. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much.